Hi, if you're new here, I'm Brian Keating, the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor at the University of California, San Diego, and I'll be your guru today to unlock one of the most interesting aspects of modern age, the confluence of computers, artificial intelligence, and physics. As AI shapes our world, it also has come to my attention that perhaps we can use it to unlock new laws of physics, new discoveries that could make it a sort of new Turing test that would replace the ordinary imitation game that Alan Turing proposed some 70 years ago. Now, using AI is, has been shown to produce all different sorts of very amusing and sometimes startling and sometimes not too politically correct images and even new video from text to video creation engines. But now we're going to venture into the world of creating new laws of nature, physical laws, to unravel secrets about the origin and physics of our universe. So strap in. This is going to be exciting. And the next few years in artificial intelligence are going to reshape my field of academia, perhaps replacing me, artificial Brian Keating, with an AI avatar. So I've thought about a few different trends that I want to pay attention to, and I'm going to take you along for the ride on this channel. The first one is the role of artificial intelligence in quantum computing, both in generating the uh, description of how quantum computers behave, but also exploiting the power, the unique power of quantum computers to do new and novel things in physics. So AI algorithms are optimizing the design of quantum circuits, accelerating the development of computers that can perform calculations beyond the reach of so-called classical computers. This synergy could soon solve complex problems in seconds, ranging from revolutions in cryptography to material science, maybe even climate modeling and exotic materials that produce new behaviors that we could use for energy generation and solve the climate crisis, things like high temperature superconductors. We also can see the role of artificial intelligence in unraveling cosmic mysteries. To understand how galaxies and stars formed, the universe is put into a box, and that box is a giant simulation. Right now, we're looking at a few billion particles and maybe more, but with the advent of AI, perhaps we could scale that up orders of magnitude more, more faithfully imitating and mimicking the behavior of these systems. And this could actually make a revolution beyond our planet by looking also at vast data sets that no human being, not even my brilliant graduate students, could ever pour through. These AI physicists could uncover new galaxies, black holes, cosmic phenomena, and put together pieces of the puzzle that we as human brain physicists with natural intelligence or natural stupidity, as some have accused me, would then be made obsolete because we just simply can't analyze and process the latent data that is present when you have surveys of billions of stars that are coming out or galaxies or regions of the cosmic microwave background that my colleagues and I study. Another realm where we're overwhelmed with data is presents an opportunity for artificial intelligence to revolutionize particle physics. Particle accelerators, such as the Large Hadron Collider, have reached their energy limit, meaning that they produce so much energy and they really can't cram any more, squeeze any more energy out of the existing tunnels. There are no new rivals in terms of size and collision center of mass energy for these uh, super colliders. So it's really up to us to glean as much information out of the existing data that we can, possibly before even proposing things like a muon collider or a collider on the moon, or perhaps a solar system collider, as some particle physicist dreamers have been proposing. Maybe it'll happen, but it's not altogether likely. So artificial intelligence is already transforming particle physics. It sifts through data at the petabyte scale that, again, no human could ever do. And a lot of what we do is throw away you know, 99.9999 events out of a petabyte worth of data, you might only have 10 or 100 events that qualify as being worthy of attention that can actually add to the credulity that we have in the standard model of particle physics and maybe reach beyond it to test exotic models such as the fundamental physics project of Stephen Wolfram. These exotic predictions can be only mined by these massive, large physics models, such as my colleagues and I are trying to develop. There's another question is whether or not you can design new materials using artificial intelligence. That could be on the macro scale, making things like new high temperature superconductors, or even at the molecular scale, doing things like design new types of drugs or nanorobots and things like that to make stronger materials, faster conducting materials, lossless power transmission for the next generation of electronics. Another major trend that has relevance to physics uh, uh, discussed with past guest Tim Palmer on the podcast is climate physics. Having a CERN but for climate physics was Tim Palmer's proposal. We need this kind of enormous scale to simulate the Earth's complex 
climate environment. You almost need a computer the size of the Earth's atmosphere in terms of the number of particles it can track. And so again, no human, no graduate student, no matter how brilliant he or she is, could ever have a fraction of the ability to assess data that artificial intelligence can and already does. So it's a valuable tool and coupled with advances in computing, speed, throughput, and design, perhaps invoking quantum computers, it may be possible to really harness the complex physics that we know about, which is actually relatively simple. We'll be discussing in just a moment the physics that was around since the 17 or 1800s, describing particles, fluid flow, and things like that. So the fusion of artificial intelligence and physics is not only expanding our knowledge, but reshaping the very methods of scientific inquiry. Will we be able to learn about new laws of physics, perhaps new forces of nature that would we otherwise be blind to, if not for the role of the artificially intelligent algorithms that are just coming online right now. So let's dive deep into what AI is good for. Can it just reproduce physics or simulate physics, which is very different than actually uh, working through a physics engine? Is it possible for an artificial intelligence to actually divine or predict new physical laws, new forces, new fields, new particles? Is that possible? I always ask the question to my audience, can an artificially intelligent entity, such as a large language model, a large physics model, can it reproduce the sensation that Albert Einstein wondered what would happen to an observer in free fall? Would he experience a gravitational field? And of course, the answer was no, and that led to the Einstein equivalence principle. We're not going to be talking about new laws of physics. We're going to talk about replicating the physics at the micro scale. And do you have to do something like CGI, which doesn't really solve physics problems, or do you actually need to solve the equations of motion for particles to create complex phenomena to visualize them, like smoke or atmospheric phenomena in uh, the Earth's uh, climatary system? So in this video, we're going to discuss a paper that proposes a neural network-based method for simulating how fluid dynamics behaves. Sounds boring, but don't worry. The tools that I discuss for you today also have an application to fake worlds, like video games too. So. In the words of my new friend, Elon Musk, we could all be living in a simulation, but the simulation would have to reproduce things on a scale that humans would otherwise be blind to, either that means by simulating a huge universe with stars placed very far apart, or by simulating things at the micro scale that we don't have access to with our current technology. So today we're going to talk about neural networks and how they were used to train and learn fluid and smoke dynamics, and how can we continue to improve them? Are they just complex you know, cartoons? or CGI. No, they're not, uh, but there's a limitation when you actually try to simulate the physics versus replicate what physics looks like. We're going to talk about how these neural networks drastically reduce the time required for predicting simulation and the outcomes of these simulations. And we'll talk about the neural network itself and how it was able to generalize beyond what it was programmed to learn and handle new and complex simulations beyond its training domain. In physics uh, graduate school, usually you learn an equation called the Navier-Stokes equation. It's actually a set of multiple equations, and they're what are known as partial differential equations that are quite complex. They describe the motion of viscous fluids. They're named after Claude Louis Navier and George Gabriel Stokes, who independently derived them in the 1800s. The Navier-Stokes equations are a fundamental foundational tool in fluid dynamics, and they've been used for hundreds of years now to model a wide variety of phenomena, including the flow of air around an airplane wing, something they couldn't have conceived of in the 1800s, the flow of water in a pipe, the motion of blood in the human body, and even the flow of things like the jet stream uh, in the atmosphere or the Gulf Stream in the Earth's oceans. Now, the Navier-Stokes equations are beautiful and they can be written in many, many ways. But the most common way is the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. That is a fluid like water, which is not compressible, and modeling how the particles in it behave, treating them as a collective. The equations are derived from the conservation of mass and momentum, two of the foundational principles of all of physics, and they can be used to describe the flow of all incompressible fluids. The incompressible Navier-Stokes equations looks like this. There's a symbol, and that symbol is called del, or the divergence of a uh, flow of the velocity field. So the first equation is is that the divergence of the velocity field u, which is symbolized by this upside down triangle, the divergence of the velocity field is zero. That means uh, we'll come to the interpretation of it in a bit. And then the density times the time derivative of the velocity flow plus the product of the velocity flow times its gradient equals the negative of the gradient in pressure plus the what's called the Laplacian of the uh, velocity flow times the dynamic viscosity, symbolized by mu. 
So these are what's called a nonlinear system of equations. They're very difficult to solve analytically, but there's many, many ways you can solve them computationally using what are called numerical methods. And we learn those in graduate school. They're very complex. They're very interesting. And you discretize the system and, and use them to simulate on the microscopic scale things that otherwise we attribute to macroscopic properties like density and pressure. So these methods are used to simulate the flow of fluids in many, many applications, as I said before, and they are used in weather forecasting, climate modeling, and as I mentioned, aircraft design, and even the flight of, say, golf ball through uh, the atmosphere. When I hit it, it doesn't get up that high, known to hit the worm burner uh, from time to time, but um, I'm working on that. Now, in addition to the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, there are a number of other forms of the Navier-Stokes equations that can be used to describe the flow of compressible fluids, such as gases. Gases can be compressed, unlike water, say, in certain incompressible fluids. The compressible Navier-Stokes equations are much more complex than the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, and they're more difficult to solve. However, the compressible Navier-Stokes equations are necessary to describe the flow of fluids at high speeds such as the flow of air around a rocket or my blasting serves in tennis. These equations are such powerful tools for modeling the flow of fluids, it's almost impossible to capture how important they are. Even though they're computationally uh, expensive, meaning they take a lot of classical computing time, they can only simulate the flow of fluids on small scales. But a new method that we're talking about today learns the dynamics of fluids from data and then simulates large-scale flows much, much faster than these old methods. It makes possible the ability to simulate fluids in real time. So you can do things and have applications in realms as diverse as virtual reality and video games. So imagine playing a golf game and, and you want to have the physics in real, rendered in real time, depending on the weather, where you're at here in San Diego. And I'd like to model the golf course on a rainy day, a cloudy day, a sunny day, and have actual representation be faithful to what I would experience if I was actually out hacking up the golf course. The key to the new method is what's called a graph-based representation of the fluid. The graph represents the particles in the fluid, and the connections between particles represent the forces that act between them. The risk representation allows the neural network to learn the relationships between the particles and to predict how the fluid will behave over time. The new method was trained on a large data set containing many, many fluid simulations. The data set included simulations of water, of smoke, and sand. The neural network learned to simulate these fluids very accurately, and it was also able to generalize to new fluids that I had never seen before during training. This new method is a significant advance in the field of fluid simulation. It was actually the first method that could simulate large-scale flows in real time. Again, opening up new vistas for rendering virtual worlds. Here's some of the physics discoveries that were made using the new method. The neural network was actually, for the first time, able to learn how to simulate fluids flowing in complex geometries that traditional fluid simulation methods can't do, so-called finite element analyses. The neural network would learn to simulate fluids with multiple phases, like liquid and water and ice and water. And this is something that traditional fluid simulations are not able to do as well. So this new method is a powerful tool for studying fluid dynamics. It can be used to simulate flows that are too complex for traditional methods, and it can be used to discover new laws of fluid physics. Now, if we could write a simulator that runs the laws of physics and basically reproduces them to create programs, why would we need a learning-based algorithm? Well, that's a good question. The goal is to show how neural network video footage of lots and lots of fluid and smoke simulations, and then have the neural network learn how the dynamics work to the point that it can continue and guess how the behavior of a smoke puff would change over time, say in a room, depending on the room's properties, its geometry, et cetera. Normally, neural networks are used to solve problems that are otherwise close to impossible to tackle. For example, it's very hard, if not impossible, to create an algorithm that detects, say, the features of a dog and can always reliably be used to discover what a dog is or a chimpanzee is. But uh, it's very difficult to write down a mathematical description of a dog or a cat or a, or a chimpanzee. But these days, we can teach a neural network to do it and not need a mathematical algorithm to determine how the sensation of a dog or identification of a dog would work. But this is a different task. The neural network is applied to solve something that we already know how to solve. Especially since if we use a neural network to perform this task, we have to train it, which is long and arduous. So oftentimes you see how fast or hear about how fast these different simulations or neural networks are, but they never include the training data and how hard and time consuming it was to produce that. So why would you want to do this? Does it make any sense? Well, 
It actually does. And for the reason that I want to explain right now is that the training step only has to be done once in this, in this particular example. And then afterwards, you just query the original neural network, which means predicting what happens next in the simulation. It goes almost instantaneously. This takes way less time and requires way less memory and overhead while retaining the high fidelity, the accuracy, as well as the precision of the simulation. What are some of the drawbacks of this approach? Well, one is known as generalization. These techniques include a newer variant that you can see in this video segment, can give us detail of the simulation in real time or close to real time, but if we present them with something that's far outside the envelope of cases that are already seen in the training data domain, they'll fail. This doesn't happen with our hand-designed bespoke training our algorithms, but only in these types of AI-based methods. So the key differentiator in this paper we're discussing today is that its generalization capabilities are actually astounding, much more capable than before. The predicted results match the simulations incredibly well. If you see it in slow motion, you can evaluate it even better. Well, another thing that can be used as a sign of generalization is if you can apply it to something other than smoke or the training data or water and so forth, you can actually apply it to say sand or slime, my kid's favorite substance. And that's a great step beyond just say water and smoke. And now this scene shows how it's working, slowing the evolution of objects with different shapes or in different simulation boxes. This is an example of, of almost preternatural new learning techniques. So it can deal with these new shapes and new boundary conditions, but it also handles the interactions of them really well as well. You can train it on a small domain with a few particles and then scale it up once it's learned these general concepts to a much, much bigger domain. You can also see what would happen in completely unknown situations. Like if you have water flowing down an incline, and then if you remove the incline ramp, you can see that it understands what to do with the particles and solving the Navier-Stokes equations in more or less in real time. Now let's try something else, an hourglass with sands running through it, such as the days of our lives. It's incredible. The paper uses this new graph-based method that represents the artificial intelligent physics that it's learning, and it can pass messages among different CPU nodes, and it can learn in that way, in this neural network way, to create a simple and generalizable model that can be a tour de force. It can be used as a great leap forward to simulate things it's never, ever encountered before, perhaps using objects that are completely deformed, understanding the behavior of fluid flow like air around complex geometries like new stealth bomber wings and so forth. So these simulations are really, really amazing. They haven't reached the point yet where they're predicting the Navier-Stokes equations. Imagine if you could go back to the 1800s and show uh, you know, sketches of sands through an hourglass, and then some intelligent you know, computing engine like Babbage's engine could predict the Navier-Stokes equation. That's the holy grail. That's what I'm looking for. Could we have shown a neural network, say, the behavior, anomalous behavior of the planet Mercury and how its perihelion advanced year by year, accumulating just a fraction of what's called an arc second. And this, uh, op these observations led Einstein to come up with a way to test his general theory of relativity. But what if it went the other way around? What if we had never, he had never predicted general relativity as an explanation? Could some computer now predict, say, the behavior of objects near a black hole and extreme gravity and use that to learn laws of quantum gravity? That's what I'm interested in. Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel, past guest Reinhard Genzel, has discussed on the podcast where they're imaging in the infrared these black holes near their event horizons or in combination multi-messenger astronomy with things like LIGO, with things like the infrared optical astronomy that Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel do. And then Shep Dolman, who is the leader of the Event Horizon Telescope, combining those three different messengers into what's called multi-messenger astronomy, could we not predict what would happen at the actual boundary between the Event Horizon and the bulk space-time that it exists in? And could we, for example, predict things like the stretched horizon, as past guest Lenny Susskind talked about the Event Horizon, where these quantum effects of gravity would be manifest if his theory is right? So stay tuned for that. I'm very interested in this project. I use artificial intelligence all the time. I use it for constructing new ways to educate my students, creating artificially intelligent teaching assistants. I'm having one of those on my website, my new site coming out soon, uh, which you'll be able to uh, have access to. 
uh, when it's done. And you can ask it questions about cosmology as if it's your own personal TA completely for free, uh, utilizing all my notes and all the course references and papers that I've read over the past uh, two decades as a professor. So that's it for now. This is an exciting time to be a physicist. We may have no need for theory. Now, the theorists will always be necessary. We'll always need that kind of zeitgeist. The spirit of the times will always require brilliant theorists like those that I feature, but we need experimentalists too and observers to collect the data so that these super intelligent, artificially intelligent overlords can then help us predict, analyze, and make sense of this incomprehensible volume of data. So stay tuned for that. And remember, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think these artificially intelligent physicists are quite magical. So let me know what you think in the comments below.